Hello, everybody, and welcome back to 20-something Live. We are here in a little bit of a different location, not my typical L.A. home, but I'm actually in New York City on business, but we didn't want to have another week go by where we couldn't provide you with the valuable information about what it means to be a 20-something, um, and today I think we have three amazing guests, which is curated by Wade Davis at Third Brain. Um, we're going to be having Connor Clark, who is the CEO and founder at Wavo. Um, he's also the marketing director at Ear Milk. In addition to being a recording artist himself, he does a whole bunch of different things and continues to impress me with each conversation I have with him. Uh, we have my good friend Daniel Novaeus, who, similar to me, started an eBay business at a very young age and now has had a lot of success in the mobile app business. And he'll fill you in on more of those. And who knows, maybe you're already using some of his games on your iPhone. And we're going to begin today with my good friend, Sean Glass. Um, Sean is one of the most entertaining, eccentric, and outside-the-box thinkers that I've had the pleasure of getting to know over the last year. Um, I am always super interested in his enthusiasm and his excitement toward, as I said, outside-the-box marketing. And he recently started a, a record label by the name of Win Music, which brought Duke Dumont to the United States. And he's also in the event business where he hosted the Heineken Domes at Coachella. Um, he's one of the most well-networked individuals I know. You may have read about him in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, or Business Insider. So let's bring him in. Sean. Hey, guys. What's up, buddy? Sorry, I had tea on the kettle. I'm turning it off. So which <laughs> headphones did you decide to go with? I, you're having I went with my Sony's. They're, they're the ones I actually use the most. So... I yeah I got them I DJed the launch party for this headphone and I'm still using them they're the best. Yeah. Are you trying to make a statement with those glasses? What that I'm eccentric or something like that? <laughs> I don't know, you tell me. Um, I don't know. <laughs> so, so talk to me. A lot of people are trying to crack the brand space. They're trying you know the future they say of the music business is brands coming in and partnering with musicians and we've seen it with Jay Z we've seen it with Lady Gaga. The deals have been a little bit controversial, and you don't necessarily do it as much on the direct-to-artist partnership. Um, from what I've seen, it's been more about the event space, which I think is a way more authentic way to go about it. So talk to me a little bit about some of the things that you've been working on in the event space with brands and how you've gotten the attention of brands to be the influencer and curator for their events. Sure. So I guess the difference between activating with an artist and activating with an event is that when you're activating with the artist, it doesn't necessarily make sense. It's just uh, you want their audience, you want their money, frankly. But with an event, like that's that's traditional. You know, Bud Light at the Super Bowl, like 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 that's synonymous with the Super Bowl. So um, yeah, I mean, I guess the most recent activation was the Heineken stage at Coachella, and that just gave me the opportunity. I mean, that was a dream gig to be able to curate a stage on Coachella. I got to make it whatever I wanted. You know, my high, I got to book Solomon and Dixon to play together. That was my personal like favorite thing. I you can't do that otherwise. Um, for me, the best part about it is the opportunities, and I guess um, why I why they work with me and not somebody else is um, I think I speak their language a lot a lot better. A lot of people are just negotiating. And um, I kind of I always come to them with unique ideas, like like the idea for the stage for all the collaborations and for the Snapchat activation. Like those those were my ideas, um, and it was what wasn't was the Snapchat just, activation? It was um, so it was called Snap Who, and uh, it was it was about surprising everyone with the lineup. Basically, half the lineup was announced, half the lineup wasn't announced, and it was announced through a Snapchat account that we created. It was uh, Weed and Kennedy was the agency that executed it, and they did a great job. And it went only, you know, so we were only speaking to the people who wanted to hear. It was, you know, I, I like Seth Godin's permission marketing a lot. So like, I don't want to be blasting people. I don't want to be bothering people. So it was a good way to, you know, engage a wide audience without just buying advertising. I, I don't I don't know what the engagement rates of, of those ad campaigns that brands create on Facebook are, for example, but the way we did this was something where everyone opted in 
and then they got a ton of information. So once you said, yes, I want this information, you got a lot of information. And that included, so like, I don't know, one of the highlights for me was when Trombone Shorty came on the last Sunday and played with, uh, with Preservation Hall Jazz Band, Escort, and Fishbone. And that was really cool for me. And that was something that got announced through the Snapchat campaign. We did the same thing with Wu-Tang Clan. So no one knew they were going to be there. And then we teased it throughout the day a couple times. We had Pusha T. Um, and yeah, I mean, th those are principles that are really important to me. I don't like, you know, awareness marketing. I like permission marketing where it's qualitative, not quantitative. It's about the product. I think a lot of 20 something things out there are struggling with finding their place in corporate America and learning to speak that language. I think that we have an incredible advantage um, having grown up as sort of the first generation to not really, I mean, barely remember, what, at least for me, what it was like to, to grow up without a computer. Um, what exactly did you do to learn the language um, to speak to these brands? Not really sure. I started as a DJ. You know what? I guess, I guess this is what it was. Um, I, I go back to DJing with everything in my career. Basically, anything before DJing, I, I, I don't care about. Like, I don't consider it important to me. The, the, my DJ career was my most important, the, the, all the lessons that I've learned. And so my first exposure to brands was DJing for brands. So I would get paid to go DJ, you know, and I still do. I would get paid to go DJ a brand's party. And so the first time, the way that the way that I applied my sensibilities for brands was the same way that I thought about DJing a room. So one of the things that I did early on was like I curated Soho House and the standard boom boom room and the way that I had to think about that was like not what do I want to play but what do these crowds want to hear and the same lessons that I learned doing that, being a better DJ for Soho House and for the standard for these movie premiere parties and stuff like that, that's how I had to think about the brands because for Heineken it's not about what's – so, for example, there's an artist that I wanted to book for Coachella that didn't get on the main lineup. Everybody wanted him on the main lineup. The guy, you know, wanted 150 grand. I had him for 20 grand. It was it was a huge I, – I won't say the name because, you know, I'll, I'll – because it's, it's controversial and shit, but, like, can I curse, by the way? Yeah, go for it, brother. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, Is it public radio? So I didn't get mad when the brand wouldn't let us book this guy. Even though he would have just, I mean, it would have been a, it would have been a, the biggest story at Coachella if we got this guy to play, like more. It would have been cooler than Outcast playing, but um, it it didn't work out because the guy curses a lot. The guy talks about Trayvon Martin, and the guy talks about, you know, he talks about stuff. He's not. He talks about Molly, and he's not supposed to talk about it. And um, you know, I got it. I get it. And. Uh, so, so I think the way that I understood, it's the same thing DJing a room of, like, rich people. When you DJ for, like, a wedding, when you DJ for fancy people at fashion parties and they pay you a shitload of money to do it, you, you're not going to play, you know, exactly what you want to play. You have to play the stuff that they want to hear. So the same thing, when Heineken's giving me this really amazing budget to go produce a stage at Coachella, I'm not doing Sean Glass, whatever I feel like doing. I'm doing some of that, but I'm also applying it for what the agenda of the brand is. And I guess, yeah, that's the, I never really thought about it, but that's probably the way that I applied that kind of thinking. It's the same thing as DJing. Right. I think there's been these glaring differences between Generation Y and Generation Z um, that I think I've talked about a little bit in past episodes, but you're seeing this sort of movement away from Lil Wayne and David Guetta, Stax, and a freedom movement. You know, Generation Y, we're a relatively passive generation. Even our one major rebellion, Occupy Wall Street, was a relatively passive rebellion. Um, you know, four out of my five best friends from high school are unemployed. One of them is un, un, uh, underemployed, excuse me, in my opinion. And it's been kind of interesting. I mean, they're all, they've all graduated or in the process of graduating from college uh, still at the age of 25, 26. But we're seeing a movement in the music that's sort of reflecting that people, I think, are at the stage in their careers. It's sort of gravitating more toward realer music. You have Lord saying no more hands in the air. You have Macklemore saying he's independent. You have Kendrick Lamar being a very authentic rapper. You have you know, Coldplay a few years ago was all about living your life. Now it's Imagine Dragons, Radioactive, and Demons. Even One Republic coming out with a song like Counting Stars, more about the pleasures in life as opposed to just being money, money, money. You are somebody that's always, you know, had great taste in music, um, and and like you said, it's so hard to play events like that. You have to curate to a more sophisticated crowd. What do you do at this point now, as you see the trend moving toward this more sophisticated, intelligence, authentic voice 
of the next generation. Um, how exactly are you going to play a role in that? And is it through artists? Is it through your label? Um, what are some of the ventures you're working on that you think will, you know, uh, create, you know, you really, I guess, make you a monumental leader as part of that movement? Sure. I mean, for me, like, I, I, I think about myself as having no competitors, not in a cocky way, but in a way of, like, if there's competitors, then I should move on. Then I should be doing something else. I'm, I'm doing the wrong thing. I've always been someone who wanted to be different and ahead of the curve. So the reason, you know, the significance of the Duke Dumont signing last year, you know, nobody got what I was doing when I did it, but I knew where it was going to go. And, you know, what I, I said, I, I, there's an email from, uh, you know, what I, now I guess it's a year and a half, two years ago, that, that was to Duke Dumont's manager where I said, I'm going to be the only guy who's with you in the DJ booth at 6 in the morning and can go track for track with you, but also wake up in the morning and get you on the Grammys. And, uh, and that, I knew that the scene was going there. It was, it was the UK bass music and, garage, and you know, future gar garage scene. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. It, it, like, how do I... You know, right now there's, an, there's another scene that's developing. You know, Saturday Night Robot Heart in New York City the Burning Man culture is is blowing up, and it's not the same kind of dance music as, you know, the Duke Dumont music and Disclosure music and Julio Bashmore and stuff like that is still, there's drops, and there's like, you know, there's big put-your-hands-in-the-air moments, but um, this culture is not. It's it's very even. It's very consistent, but uh, but that's what's happening. That's next, and and that's where I'm living right now. That The, the music that I'm putting out this year is not UK-based music, is not, I'm not trying to repeat more Duke, I got sent a ton of Duke Dumont's this year, and, you know, all the labels, you know, over there are saying, oh yeah, you licensed that record, like, had, people are sending me records that sound like it, that are great records, you know, like, Storm Queen, Route 94, all these, you know, uh, uh, Hideaway, all these tracks that are going number one in the UK, like, they're not ones that I want to break, they're, they're awesome, amazing records, but, like, that's the stuff that I, I, I had the first one. And I just yeah. What are you interested? Place. Yeah. So where do you see the sound going? I think it's going to a different kind of house music. I don't know exactly. I have this conversation every day. I don't know how to classify it. Um, but uh, it's this kind of cathartic, spiritual, deep house. Um, you know, the next record we're putting out is Annabelle England, who who people know from Hot Natured. Um, so it's Human Life and Annabelle England. Um, we have a record. I I wish. I, I can't even say it, but because the deal's not like 100% done yet. But the other one that I'm really excited about is is an album that is like I think this duo that are the best guys in the scene. Um, wow! I wish I could say it. It's really annoying. Um, but uh, but but you know, people people who you know, I, I say I say Burning Man house music. Honestly, like it sounds like a joke, but it's very. I have no better way to describe it. It's this kind of I, I use the words cathartic and spiritual. And then to really describe, it, it's music that's played at Robot Heart and stuff like that. And that's what I'm really interested in right now. There's a few different sounds. Um, I was on with the, uh, I really love like what, you know, the tastes of Majestic Casual also. So that's like a UK sound. That, that, those guys, like Eton Messi and, and Majestic Casual, um, I love their tastes. And those were guys who were peers of my tastes when Disclosure and Duke Dumont were making it last year. And now they're moving in these different directions. If you go on, uh, if you go on Majestic Casual right now, we have churches as, as featured, um, which I don't know. Just to to clarify, I work with Glass Note Records also, which is my dad's label. Um, and there's a couple records that are these kind of like Ibiza. Uh, there's there's two more records that I'm putting out that are these like early like sunrise house music vocals. Sort of it's. Similar to what Chris Malinchak did last year with So Good to Me and Monkey Safari with High Life, those kinds of records are really exciting to me. And I want to be doing stuff that, you know, the mainstream hasn't hasn't gotten yet, but is going to get next year. So right now they're all in the UK. Like, all that Black Butter sound is dominating right now, and that's the cool stuff. I want to be on what's next. Cool. Um, everybody that's tuning in, remember you can ask your question just by hashtagging 20 something live I will see them and be able to ask them to Sean directly Sean you're an incredible networker do you have any advice for people out there that are looking to network and might not have as much experience as you do sure uh, I mean very simply like you know read a lot 
like, yeah, I'd say read a lot and focus on doing something well. There's a lot of people in this generation, a lot of people think, oh, we're the multitasking generation, the ADD generation, all that. I don't think it's a generation anymore. It's just a, the world. <laughs> but um, often when I meet people, a lot of, you know, people want to, I, I do a bunch of different things. It's hard to, it's hard to summarize. It's hard to understand for a lot of people. And when I meet people, often they like want to get involved in everything. They're like, oh yeah, cool. Like they, they want to be part of the vision, but I don't really give a shit about that. I want people who I can do one specific thing with. So for example, like the, like a call that I had today with this YouTube channel that I, I really love. And I was talking to them about like, Hey, like, yeah, I want you to feature my record, but also, like, what about these other ideas? And, you know, I want to find a way to activate with them. We are never going to speak again. If all, if all I'm doing is sending them music, we have no reason to talk. I want to find a reason to talk to them because I think they're cool. And the way that people, the way that, the people that I make, you know, when I, I have 10 people a day that I talk to, those are people that I can activate stuff with. It's not people, it's not, it's not personal relationships. It's not, you know, hot girls. It's not, like, being at the right party. I don't give a shit if you're at my party, if you, like, like you're in the right room. I don't care. It's what's your relevance there. And if you're, you know, 20 years old, like, don't go to conferences and get business cards. Do something. Like, focus, make, create something. You know, Jake, you're, 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 you're younger than I am, and you focus on one particular thing, uh, like, this is what I'm, you know, I'm going to break Cruella. I'm going to be that guy who breaks Cruella. And now you have a million different things that you can do. A lot of people in this generation get really nervous about doing one thing. And I think that they're, I think it's more admirable than people understand. And, you know, I fall victim to it all the time. I spent the last five months on events and I neglected my record label. Like if you look at my website right now, I haven't updated it. It's my one year anniversary today, actually. We put out the Duke Duke record. Thanks. A year ago today, and I haven't put a release out since the Grammys, because like I had all these events, and the events were more important. Um, but I neglected the label, so now I'm back on the label stuff, and now we have 12 releases in the next three, four months, which is a shitload. But you know, now I can't do any events for a moment. <laughs> I don't know. But th that that's networking is focus. And then when you cool. meet people, it's relevant, and it's like, oh, you're the guy who did that. Cool. That's all you need to know. Cool. Um, we have a message from my good friend Blake over at Proximity. He says, how important have you seen these curator channels on YouTube help the industry? Ridiculously important. Yeah. I talked about Eton Messi and Majestic Casual. It's like, if you look at the UK base and, and future garage scene, for like people who like disclosure, go on, go on the World Wide Web. And like every image that's associated with disclosure is the same imagery created by Nick from... Uh, from Majestic Casual, like it's uh, all those videos and all that stuff, like, like the girls and the the soft tones. That 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 has bled across every form of media. The live events to use the flyers, like, um, I mean, just alone, like you can have. I mean, you know, Jake can speak to this much better than I can. Uh, you can have a ton of. It's it's not just about the scale of you know millions and millions and millions of unique views, but uh, there's revenue there. Like it's amazing advertising and amazing curation, but it's revenue as well. So like I'm not selling a ton of records, but like you know soon hopefully we'll be developing our YouTube strategy, and that will be revenue that I can factor into my record deals. I've been fascinated. Uh, by guys like Blake, you know, he asked that question. He obviously has one of the biggest channels that's breaking music in the space and proximity. And I've really been fascinated as I get to know him, Nick over at Majestic Casual, Olivier over at The Sound You Need, all very close friends of mine. And my challenge to all of them is to find a way. Um, and I, sorry, I forgot my good friend Gibran over at Mr. Suicide Sheep, which Gibran, which I feel like I have to um, state as well because he's been very supportive. And you know, UKF. I, yeah, I mean, there's been yeah, there's a whole bunch yeah. of them. Luke over at UKF. I mean, I, I could go if I went can't, on and on. I'm out of it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean they've done such amazing things, but UKF is one of the ones where um, they have made it into a legitimate business, and I I think that it's all the million YouTube records. Channel, yeah, a YouTube channel is a legitimate business because there's revenues coming in. 
but as the industry changes, you kind of never know what's going to be next. And I always talk about cohesively branding your message, your movement across every single touch point. I call it communication intelligence. And I think that that's one of the thing where, things where the YouTube channels will become so much powerful. You saw Majestic Casual take a stab at it by having an ultra music festival stage. You, um, Olivier, I work with him all the time on his SoundCloud. You know, it's like those are new touch points. And I think that when we start thinking about instead of it just as a singles business, getting behind cool new songs, it becomes about getting behind a movement, getting behind an artist, or breaking their own artist. And obviously, you know, UKF did a phenomenal job of that with the whole Skrillex Night Party, 12 Planet movement. And it will be interesting to see. Um, out of all those channels that are growing so quickly, who has the business savvy and makes the right partnerships to turn themselves into very successful businesses beyond successful YouTube channels that generate a significant amount of income. And who knows, maybe Sean and I will be starting our own YouTube channels and being a part of it, but um, for now those guys, you know, they've created an incredible market share for themselves and kudos to them for um, creating businesses right from at home in their computer. I think they're actually a testament to what it means to be a 20-something and just doing something they love. I know all of them, I don't think any of them really intended for it to be something so big that it's become, but it has because they've just followed what they, they love and um, similar to you, Sean, they have great taste in music. So, um, awesome. to, to add, like I, I think specifically YouTube has... I, we didn't even when YouTube started. I don't think the strategy was like, oh man, we're gonna be, we're gonna take over MTV. We're gonna be the new. It, it, they are the curators. These YouTube channels. If you go on Spotify, who wants to be the curators? And I think it will become. You know, and Beats Hipster International is the biggest playlist, the most influential playlist out there. Sean Parker's Hipster International. Nowhere near, in my opinion, nowhere near the. Uh, it's not as interesting as well curated or as influential as something like UKF. Like the impact of UKF is, I mean, um, so, 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 so much better. And there's a, bu there's a bunch of them. And they're really, really, and they're young, which is most exciting. Like Luca cool. is, is great. They're all super young. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, um, Sean, thank you so much for joining us. We'll let you going back to being a Backstreet Boy. So thank you so much though for, for joining us and thank good luck you. with thank all you guys the releases for coming me. out. Yeah, good luck with all the Thanks releases guys. coming out and win music. I'm in New Appreciate York, by the way, that. if you want to hang. Let's hang. Right. See ya. Cool. Um, guys, we always have a song of the week. And um, this week I'm I'm gonna do it kind of in a in a little bit of a different way. I'm gonna um, put my attention and my focus on both a song and an artist. Um, there was a song that came out this week that I think really bridges the gap that you're seeing, you know, we all kind of know that the genre walls are coming down and one of, uh, you know, fellow Chicago native Vic Mensa put out a song earlier this week called Down On My Luck and it does an incredible job of incorporating some of the garage elements that really have taken over the dance scene over the last year and adding a nice hip hop flair to it and I think it's really a phenomenal record. And then keeping with the whole rap dance vibe. Uh, my boy Goldlink, who I got the pleasure of linking with yesterday, thanks to his awesome manager, Henny. Um, I think Goldlink is really one of the future rappers, lyricists, that's going to be doing some really interesting stuff, putting out music, you know, with the production of artists and producers that are on the selection label, and he just played his first show in LA, and I know he's got a lot of people that are interested in working with him. So if you haven't checked out Goldlink's album, The God Complex, be sure to check it out because you're going to be hearing a lot more of him. And now we move on to our second guest. Um, he is an entrepreneur of all sorts. Ever since the first day I met him, um, we bonded in several ways. We both went to the Indiana University's Kelly School of Business. And it's been, you know, a lot of people talk a big game in college, but it's kind of been interesting to see who stands up to it and continues to thrive regardless of market conditions or entering new industries and understanding how to pivot um, once in an industry, your business into becoming a success, no matter what challenges are thrown your way. And one of those guys that have done that is my good friend, Daniel Novaeus. So, uh, Daniel, welcome to the show. Hey, what's up, man? How are you doing? I'm doing great. How's Chicago treating you? You ready to get out of there or what? <laughs> I mean, at least it's finally, it's like 73 today, you know, so it's uh, actually not as bad as typical, so... You're, you're our, we've, we've had some tech people on the show, but you're our first guy where, um, you know, you're in the mobile app business. I think the mobile app business is absolutely fascinating. We'll get to that in a second. But I want to start with 
your story of how you started your first business and how it became what it became, which I think is an incredible testament to your success and drive from a young age and where you were even inspired to begin that process from. Uh, I think you know everybody watching could really learn a lot from it. Sure. Um, yeah, man. As you know, like I'm the biggest like advocate for uh, youth entrepreneurship. Uh, I started like my first company uh, like when I was around like I had just turned 16. I was like I think I was 15 actually at the time, um, and I was working at um, you know Polo, right? Typical thing that a student would do, and I just felt like I worked like. 30 hours that week and I killed myself and then you see your paycheck at the end of the day it's like 150 bucks and I was like well at this rate I'm gonna die before I even like do anything with this money you know this this is terrible um, so I kind of then started thinking like what can I do to like kind of make some money and as like sketch as it was I was using my own corporate discount to like make some like money on eBay and stuff um, but that kind of opened me up to kind of selling things online and seeing like so, so you were wait so you were buying things with your corporate discount and then yeah, yeah. selling them for above the corporate discount price on eBay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, now this has been like such a long time that I don't think I'll get in trouble anymore with uh, with Polo, but... Bring uh, it, baby. Yeah. No to, rules. <laughs> essentially, what I would do is uh, there was like a... This, these like jackets that were like 50% off. I was getting them for like 150 bucks. I checked them out online and they were selling for like 320 And I literally like bought three... Um, of them, and then I kept the receipt, thinking like, okay, shit hits the fan, I'll just bring it back, no big deal, and literally sold all three that day, and I was like, I just made 600 bucks, you know, so I did this like about 20 more times, and then finally I heard it, I was about to get canned uh, for using the discount, because like word got out what was happening at school, and um, then I stopped there, but at that point, you know, I already had made like, you know, five grand in that capital, and that was enough starting capital to kind of like get into like you know buying other stuff wholesale and reselling it and stuff like that um, and the moral of that story is like one thing kind of led to the other but by the time I was a freshman in high school and, and college that business was doing nearly two million dollars in, in uh, revenue a year you know I had expanded um, I had a warehouse in the UK at the time you know like eventually I moved to Australia for a little while and set up a warehouse there but that like that opened up so many doors for me by starting that business because at Kelly I got loads of scholarships. I barely had any college debt. Like I, I, I was like making more than my tuition was costing um, just through scholarships, through being an entrepreneur, and I was already making income throughout those, all those years. Um, that kind of led into like lo doing loads of different businesses and and being able to bootstrap the current company I, I had today. I mean, we've raised venture funding now, but um, you know, it, it just has opened up many doors throughout my life. Let's stick with the eBay business for a second. Um, I had, you know, a similar experience where I wasn't using a corporate discount, but I actually was collecting stuff and buying it from sports memorabilia from retail stores. I was going on eBay and seeing how much cheaper I could get it for, so I started buying from there instead of going to my local hobby store, and mm -hmm. which I think most are now out of business. And then one time I bought something, didn't like it, put it back on eBay. It went for more money than I had paid for, it, and that was kind of like my first... Um, indulgence with capitalism where I just said, wow, um, this is a whole new world. And I, I proceeded to think similarly how you did, which was what kind of stuff can I buy low and sell high? And I remember yeah. some of those products that were so innovative where I thought, okay, I can make $100 off this and I wound up making you know, really good money off of it over, you know, but if I thought I would sell a couple of them and I wound up selling thousands of them. Right. Uh, how did you find that next product? Because it's, it's like that first idea of using your corporate discount was interesting but not genius what was it's not the... sustainable yeah um, so actually that's so that's a good question like I, I think that um when you when when you get these issue situations like okay how in the hell do I compete with like apt or these huge stores if I'm selling electronics you know um, I think this is I, I started thinking a global uh, like sense, right? So I know that like items in America, I, I'm from Brazil originally, so like maybe it was just being like growing up in like an international family and, and traveling a lot and seeing like kind of what was going on in different cultures, I mean that definitely helped a lot, but um, what, was, what essentially happens is like an item will come out in America 
like say like the new BlackBerry will come out in America, um, six months before it'll come out in Europe and Latin America, and then I started seeing those like arbitrages and prices. So in America, it might have cost three hundred, but it hasn't come out in 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 the UK yet, and it might be like six hundred because there the people have to get it from America. So then I started buying items and exporting them overseas and then selling that. So literally. I was making like 20-30% margins where like all my competitor industry average was like 6% and that's after paying all the duties and doing that stuff so then I learned loads of stuff about like importing and exporting and I was doing the exact opposite of what people thought. They thought I was buying from China and taking it into America like everyone else. I was actually taking from America and sending it back to places where it wasn't available yet and just that goes back to the supply and demand you know. Super interesting. Um you know, caught my attention, obviously, the first time we met. Um, so we graduated, I think, in the same year, one year apart, and you um, were already kind of diving into the concept of the app business. I was just starting with Corella at the time, not right out of school, but a little bit after that. And we had a meeting in Chicago where you kind of pitched me on an app business that still exists today but has taken numerous pivots across the way. I know you spoke at tons of conferences. You've hundreds, I'm sure, of meetings. But um, you told me when we, we met up, we, we served on a panel for recess together a few weeks ago in back in Bloomington, Indiana. You told me you guys put out last year, what was it, 25,000 apps in the App Store? Uh, we had, no, we had, yeah, we had 25,000 people th come through our, um, the first version of our builder. And, and I mean, that, that itself has a great lesson, like, um, to anyone that's trying to be an entrepreneur. Uh, like, I cannot tell you how embarrassed I was, like for the the first version of my product, right? But it's like like the great saying goes, like if you are completely 100% happy with the current product that you have, then you probably have, like waited too long to like launch. Um, so we kind of launched this first builder. That's sort of the MV, the, M the MVP mentality, like the MVP. minimum viable. Product. Yeah, exactly. Our, touch on that too, because I don't think most people watching probably know what that means. Right, so an MVP is, is it's basically, uh, well, if everyone like wants to read a book, you should read The Lean Startup. Um, it's, a, it's a great book that will kind of teach you, like, okay, this is how I do the bare bones of my business, and let's see if this is even a, co a viable concept. But essentially, we, we got this first version out just to see if there was interest in the market, you know, and that's when we got, like, 25,000 people come through our, our, our stuff, and we got loads of great feedback and, and all this information, and, like, I picked up on so many trends that, like, I would never have picked up on if I didn't have those 25,000 people. And the biggest problem that we would have is, like, oh, we can't give them this feature because we don't have it available, or uh, it's not ready to, to we're going to work on that, but it's not ready yet. But basically, you know, people, a lot of people decide to have, like, free apps and things like that. Um, but the amount of knowledge I gained, and then that I'm now taking to this second version of our product and, and this new thing that we're going to be doing, that launching towards the end of the year, is something that's truly invaluable, you know, and I would never have learned that by not have launching, you know, like a year and a half ago when I was first talking to you. Because even like if you think that you've thought of everything, there's always like more eyes will definitely teach you more and, and, and stuff like that, you know. You guys you guys recently just raised a round of funding. Your company's called Mobile X Labs. What exact what kind of app business are you in? Uh, you know, you're curating apps and getting them to store for some other people, but what have you some of your most successful apps or partnerships been that you're proud of that maybe somebody watching even has already played around with or downloaded? Yeah, so uh, so MobileX started out as an app builder. Uh, what we found was though is that um, the app builder business was tough, right? We we did have all these people come through, but most of them are selecting our free plan because we can't give them a good enough good features where they're willing to pay, you know, a uh, hundred bucks a month for them. Um, and and so we were like, shit, like, what should we do, you know? Um, and this is, like, where it comes back to, like, being a hustler, right? I started using my own app builder and making, like, random apps, like, playlist apps, like, all these random apps that, like, uh, kind of cater to niches. But something that started making, like, 25, 30K a month, right? And not... It, it, that's not, like, that much money, but when you're running it with four other guys and your burn's, like, 20... Like, and you see 25 come in, you're like, oh, I did not, I am not in the red this month. Like, I, it's literally, like, a, a huge accomplishment. Um, so then that kind of led to, like, well, why don't we, like, just take, like, do kind of, like, what Google does, like, in terms of, like, 80-20. So 80% of our time, we'll work on the SaaS product and, and, and do this, like, app builder stuff. And then 20% of the time, let's think of some good ideas and launch either an app or a game or something like that and then just market it, right? And that's what I've always been good at is consumer marketing. Um, 
and and we did that, and uh, and then we came up with the concept for this one app called it was called Instaliker, and um, it was it was like kind of a stupid idea, but it literally we made this app in five days, and this app like literally generated like a million dollars. Like it, it was literally like the, the our top days were generating twenty k a day. It was like fucking insane, and um, but that app essentially like turns my business to another level, right? Uh, even though it was completely not relevant to what I was doing as as an app builder, but it was completely relevant when I go to VCs and then they're they're like talking to me like, well, what's your revenue? So, well, currently I'm making thirteen thousand. Uh, oh, I made fourteen thousand yesterday, and I'm currently the tenth app in the App Store ahead of Dropbox and Wall Street Journal. That and they're like, well, what the hell? It's like, oh yeah, we just did that on the side. Guys are like, you know, so you you take that and and that kind of like set our business up to a different a level by just like thinking outside the box like okay how do we stay alive and not fold but still remain like you know on focus of what we're doing and now you know we went from like four people in, in August to like we're up to like 33 full-time people you know around the world so and you're you're the only you're the you're the only found I mean owner right other than the people that invested no so I have a co-founder he's uh he's okay. in the UK um he's a he's a He's fucking amazing. You should definitely meet him, Jake, because he's like a 20 year old kid. He's a hustler. Dude, it is such a fucking crazy story. We're going to do a I'm whole PR thing on this. Um, so we, uh, you know Fiverr, right? Yeah. Like, I don't recommend no. anyone. No I don't way. recommend. No, no, dude. This is, yeah. It's, it's here. Like, I don't recommend anyone, like, going through this and, and finding their co-founder this way. And we haven't, like, put this out in the media or anything. Uh, and it wasn't, that wasn't my intention, you know, but, like, this put kid. It out right now. Yeah, well, I mean, we're gonna we're gonna talk. I mean, we're gonna probably be a little public with it later. But in any case, um, so yeah, I'm just looking, and I was I think I can't remember what I was doing on five. I was probably making some sort of bullshit video or something. But in any case, I looked like what kind of poor soul is making an app, you know, for five dollars? And I find this kid. I hit him up. I'm like, hey, I need you to make uh, an app for me. He's like, oh, well, this app's kind of complicated. It's going to be at least seven gigs, which is like 35 bucks. So I'm like, okay, kid, like, sure, let's do it. And I figured like it was going to be terrible. And lo and behold, man, three weeks later, there's this like this game that's still in the app store. It's a terrible game, but it was like a game that was made for 35 bucks. And we developed this friendship online. And I thought the whole time this kid was from like you know a third world country where it's like, okay, well, maybe the average wage there is like. Uh, 80 bucks a month, and and maybe he's killing it, making 400 bucks a month. I don't know. I found out that he was like a high school kid that just like was didn't think he was worth like he wasn't he didn't know his own worth, right? He just wasn't a business guy. And um and then after a while, I was like, dude, like you do so much great work because he really improved over the course of like a year and a half. He became a great developer. And then I brought him to America and to like to be my co-founder and to work on Mobile X, right? And he took a year off school, off college, and all this stuff. And eventually, you know, that led to one thing led to another. And, you know, before he knew it, you know, we were a venture backed company with all this traction and Is now he in Chicago like, with you? Dude, so that's another thing. I like we uh we had to go through so much shit because uh I mean the visa immigration, like these laws were written in the nineteen sixty. So they're not like for today. Like programmers, a lot of them don't go to college and stuff like that. So I had to get him the same visa, like an O1 visa, that like Nobel Peace Prize get winners get, like like uh, NBA players and all that stuff. Did you and, get it? Um, it got approved yesterday. Oh. So we were, yeah. So it was, it was a big, big thing for us. But uh, yeah, man, it, it's like it's crazy. But the story itself is just like I met this kid on Fiverr. Yeah, it was, I love it, it though. I love it. I, I met, um, you know, I met a, a previous business partner of mine on eBay, um, and it's amazing to me. I'll be in like a networking scenario, or um, you know, I'll be with uh, some friends, and they say, "Oh, how'd you meet this person that we're hanging out with?" I'm like, uh, "We actually just met. We've just been internet friends." I mean, it's amazing the yeah. way that that works in today's world, and um, some of us are able to have, you know, I guess the the EQ to be able to build a relationship. Up very world that we live in, but it's a it's a global world, and um, I guess that you know leads to my next question. The app business is can be big business; it can be very lucrative. But when I look at the amount of apps on my fucking phone, right? I got hundreds of apps. Mm -hmm. I mean, other than the occasional watching of Netflix, maybe I owe somebody money Venmo, and I've, I've done it you know one time. I paid via that. I mean, 
I don't use any of this shit, right? So is the app business becoming more about short-term wins? Because it seems like the big apps, like the Grubhubs or um, – I'm trying to think what else is like, you know, the YouTube app. Those are businesses that lived on the internet and on a computer prior to becoming app business. Right. Is, is it more about these fads that are just real quick wins like InstaLiker where, you know, you're trading Instagram likes with people who want to become influencers in the world and they're buying your app to, to make it happen? Um, and how do you balance out wanting to have, you know, long-term sustainable businesses versus always having to come up with the next new thing, which, by the way, I don't know if you could talk about it, but the one you told me in the car when I left, Hasn't left yeah. my my fucking mind. I, I I'm, I'm it makes me laugh every time I think about it. So just so you know, I got I got a I got a deck to send you, uh, by the way. But yeah, um, in any case, like, um, so dude, I mean, I I I I put apps in like two different categories, right? It, it depends what your kind of goal is, right? Well, I put three categories, right? There's great apps that that people that developers make, but they're not good marketers, so no one finds out about them. Uh, they don't make any fucking money, but they're. Do you ever apps. find those and bring them to market? For them, if, if if I find someone that I think has a great app, I will definitely like. I, I will try. You know what I'm saying? Um, but I haven't. It's hard to find them because I I don't find them either. You know, uh, it's not like I just sit around there. But um, then there's like the apps like Instalaker, which I didn't launch that thing thinking like, okay, this is my this is my home run. This is what I'm doing for life. Um, I figured like, dude, if I make 10, 20 grand off this, I would be more than happy. You know, but but and then it made that money. But like, it's still not in a day. Yeah, it's not sustainable though. Um, and then there's those apps that kind of build um, a network or a value, and those are like I think content-rich apps. Like games have it. We make games as well, and they have the lifespan. It's like okay, games popular for a month, and then you might have a game that's like Candy Crush, but you know it's it's rare you'll find a home run like that. But even Candy Crush has its lifespan. You know what I'm saying? So um, I think apps that create a lot of value are the apps that are not just they're not the apps, they provide content, right? Snapchat is popular because your friends are on Snapchat. Instagram is popular because there's always new pictures. Facebook is like, these things are popular because they create content and people are always using them because they want to see the new content that's out there and there's always something new to see, you know? Um, that's what I've really noticed in, in the app market um, and that's why that idea that I told you is, is, a, is an invaluable idea because it's always new content. It's a no. It's a network, and, and those are the type of businesses that I feel like if you want to have a sustainable business in the app market, it needs to be something that there's always new content that you get your friends to to join, and that something that people talk about. Like, what's the reason that I would tell you about this app? Like, and and why would you want to keep using it? You know, that and that's the biggest problem with my old business model, which was like the reason, like not that we pivoted, but the reason that we kind of added this new thing, is that. Why does why does why do you would you want ten apps that do this that like why would you want this like pastrami stores app and like the Corella app and the Blau app and whatever app um, and and just taking up space on your phone you know why don't you get it a place that has it in like one you know something like that so um, so we, we should I mean, talk because we should we should revisit um, we should definitely revisit that original concept somebody's going to make that happen as Facebook continues. To, I mean, think about like this episode of 20-something right now. I put this up on Facebook, and people know about it. I'm on the phone with people all day or getting texts like, hey, I'm excited for 20-something tonight. Like, cool. It's not like, yeah. you know, it's not like hundreds or thousands of people or anything like that, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a group of people. What happens if Facebook just, you know, it's like in the process of as they continue to decrease the filter by which people who are tuned in can reach the information without having to pay for it, it becomes more corporate. The more corporate mm -hmm. it becomes, the more the kids are leaving. If the kids are leaving, yeah. where are they going? They're exactly. going to platforms that don't actually have as good of a content distribution network, which is horrible. Yeah. Because right. like Twitter, things go away too quickly. Like you can't, you know, stay in tune. It's not like it, things migrate to the top and maybe they'll eventually have a feed where it does have, you know, they kind of have their top stories feed. It's like mm -hmm. what is going to happen, it's relatively interesting, and I think it's going to be these third-party niche social networks that people tap into, and I think there's a big business there. Yeah, man. I, I agree with you. Like, I had a, I, I'm sure that you know the Facebook reach at 1%. I mean, dude, Facebook's just fucking making money, dude. They're hustling. They provided. They did the biggest scam of all time. The biggest scam, and they were, they were like, okay, hey, brands, come buy Facebook pages. Buy likes. Grow your page. Send all your users here. Right, and you do that for like three years, and everyone's super happy. It's like, yes, like we have. Look how many Facebook fans. These are worth it. Every Facebook fan's worth 150 bucks. And then like three weeks ago, they're like, you know, uh, one percent reach now. So out of all these fans that you bought, we're not going to let anyone see the stuff that you actually post. 
unless you pay us, right? Yeah, Literally and the, the worst biggest part about it, bait and switch. The worst part ever. about it, to go back to your, your, your talk about content, is that the Facebook page in and of itself, no matter what you do, how creative you are, there's no way to provide value every day to make somebody, I mean, how many, for everyone watching, how many Facebook pages do you go to every single day? My, my yeah. guess is zero. So, um, so you know, it's it's interesting to me, um, and there's there's it's really interesting. It's unfortunate um, that that's what corporate America does, and it's made me sort of think a lot. You know, as I build my business and work with recording artists, more hesitant to work with brands. I, I love to work with brands. I love creative activation. I love creative partnerships, but I'm more interested in creating businesses than I am in striking deals where. Your authenticity can be questioned because for Facebook, surely it, it, it's a short-term win, but I don't know long-term what it stands to gain, and it's unfortunate because it is such a fucking amazing content platform um, to spread knowledge. You know of, of things like our, our episode right now. So, Daniel, we could go on forever, my brother, but uh, we have a third guest that we got to get to. I want to revisit that idea when we we hop off sometime in the next few days, and I can't wait to see that other game in the store. I hope that I'm not wasting my time playing it, but I'm sure there's going to be millions of people that are, so congrats on all your success, and I hope to hang soon, buddy. Let me know when you're in L.A. I'll be there next month. All right, everybody. Um, I hope you learned a little bit about the app business um, and technology and, of course, entrepreneurial innovation. Speaking of entrepreneurial innovation, our next guest is somebody who's attempting to change the way by which we discover the hottest tunes on the internet in addition to his role as a marketing director for one of the most influential blogs and partnering with his brother as a DJ duo producer and I guess as I call producers recording artists. So uh, let's bring him on, my good friend Connor Clark. Connor, what's up buddy? Hello? Hey. Connor? Yeah. What's up, Can man? You hear me? Hey. No more mute button. What's up? Um, yeah, that one's killing me today. Um, great show so far. There's a lot of great segues too into what we're doing. Um, Bring it, brother. We'll let you decide where you want to begin. <laughs> um, well, it's just, you know, you and Sean Glass had a really great conversation about curators and YouTube channel channels. And um and then you just had a great conversation about um, social Facebook decreasing the reach and decreasing distribution for uh, music on the platform, and that's kind of where that's that's what we're trying to look at and um, figure out solutions and be in that space with Weibo. You know, it's interesting you bring that up because as I was thinking, I was going to suggest it to one of my friends who I've mentioned before on this show um, who owns, you know, partnerships with hundreds of, he's actually been on the show too, but he owns partnerships with hundreds of these YouTube channels and he's found a way to sort of create branding for all of them, but there really isn't a way that I can sort of watch all of them and decide what's the most trend-worthy, you know, if 10 channels that all have, um, all have different genres that they're posting every day. It's not about necessarily which gets the most views in 48 hours. It's like which is the most right. viral compared to what it normally would be on their channel. And then how do you compare all those? And then how do you create, you know, as we just talked about a third-party social network. And I think right. that you guys are, you know, on your way to um, to doing That's that. That's what we're and trying to build. Them. Yeah, you have a minimum viable product in the marketplace with Wavo. So why don't you begin there and right. talk to our audience a little bit about what Wavo yeah. is and how you stand to curate market for the new age music marketplace. So with Wavo, um, we're trying to be the place for trending music, both the place to discover trending music and then also as an artist, want to get your music trending. So basically the, Wavo, the way Wavo works is people share music on the platform. Um, they share them in visual kind of what's close to blogs and then the most popular music that's being shared on the platform trends up our charts and is distributed to a wider audience. So there's really there's two things, two core things in that, and that is that everyone acts in the curation process, um, and that it's fully focused on music. So there is no other noise to dilute distribution. So every so compared to um, YouTube channels, uh, where it really is still curators, and it's 
one or two guys at every channel um, deciding what's the you know the music that they're going to put out, and they have big um, audiences. But what you were talking about is how do those guys really become part of a movement, or how do they lead a movement? And what we want to do is how do you get the whole community involved in surfacing that content, and the whole movement involved in deciding what's going to become popular. Um, and then the other part of that is uh, when you take away everything other than music, then music can be distributed uh, a lot more efficiently on a platform. So part of the reason problem with Facebook is that you're competing with the thousand other Facebook pages that people are following um, that aren't music. So you're always going to be fighting over them for reach in the feed. So it's not just because Facebook has come along and decided they want to decrease the reach on um, all the fan pages. It's also because there's just more and more fan pages that you're competing against. Makes sense. You guys, you guys have come up with some of your own short-term solutions to bring some people to the platform, such as partnering with different record labels to allow them a new age A and R system that you know can sort of allow music to trend within a population of unsigned records, both for consideration inclusion in DJ sets as well yeah. as consideration to be put out on the label. Um, where are you guys at now, as far as beyond those third-party widgets that you've been making? in actually becoming this place of curation on the internet um, for music and where do you see it going over the next two years? So uh, yeah, we've partnered with over 200 different EDM radio stations, labels, blogs, uh, YouTube channels uh, to act as a way of helping those guys, those curators discover what is going what they should be signing, what they should be playing on their radio, leveraging the power of our crowd. Um, so right now, uh, we have a lot of big EDM labels from Tool Room to um, Tool Room to Casablanca to um, all sorts of different labels, and it, as and our own label that we just partnered up with, Zero Three, which will be releasing. Um, tracks every month from artists. So lots of lots of music that's coming out is going to come through the crowd now, as opposed to just one A and R guy, which we find is kind of which we want to make the future of how music is discovered and distributed. Obviously, over the past couple of years, the gatekeepers of the music industry, the major record labels, even in some cases the indie record labels, are yeah. Released replaced by people's own independent movements. Um, it's incredible what you can do on your own. I'm learning firsthand um, through managing Zoo. Um, you know, we're completely independent. What we've been able to do sometimes even surprises me, said humbly, of course. Um, the internet is a very democratic marketplace for music. As you mentioned, things are now decided by the crowd. So is it your guys' goal to sort of um, create something that's more organized from what's really a cluttered mess of noise online? <laughs> Yeah, but you know, I actually don't think that the music um, that music on the internet has become as democratic as we'd like it. I mean, part of the inspiration behind Weibo became came from my experience with the blogosphere, um, which you know, Zoo has had amazing success on lately, and he's had he had he's had a great he has a great story. He's killed it on the blogosphere, and you think that the blogosphere is really open and democratic, but you know if you did look at something like Hype Machine, Hype Machine tracks 843 music blogs, and that's what Hype Machine does. So that is very cool. But right now, that is how a lot of indie artists break out. But when you look at tracking 843 music blogs, well, that's 843 gatekeepers that you need to go through, that you need to develop relationships before you get your music to them, and then it needs to get onto Hype Machine. And even for those blogs, Hype Machine acts as a gatekeeper, because Hype Machine decides what blogs should be tracked by Hype Machine. So it's not really all that much different from a set of labels who decide 
what music should get on. And there's there's nothing wrong with that. It's 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 those bloggers are working hard at Ear Milk. We're working super hard to find out what you know. We have great writers, but it's just that curator aspect. Um, no matter how smart those people are, no matter how smart the A&R guys at the label are, they're never going to be as open or able to surface content the way a robust, open community like, say, Reddit can with content that's that surfaced. So it, it, it's open in ways, but there's still a lot of gatekeepers. So when me and, me and my brother put a track out, you know, I'm part of one of the, the most followed blogs on Hype Machine. But when me and Liam put a track out, we still have to get that track out on a bunch of different music blogs. And sometimes, you know, different bloggers, they're busy. They're, 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 um, and some bloggers, some bloggers, some blogs are, are putting up music from labels or PR, and maybe they're not looking at their inbox. A lot of them are, but a lot of a lot of them won't be looking at their inbox for those new artists. So as a as a new artist, how do you get onto that platform? Because into that ecosystem, because even for me and my brother, we tried to number one on Hype Machine twice, but uh, it's it's a difficult process, and it comes out of those relationships built up over time. And that's speaking from someone who's in a position of being a part of a of a major blog. Right. So you kind of have the best perspective on it, and being an artist too. <laughs> Does being an artist give you sort of this creative outlet that you kind of really enjoy to sort of balance out and realize, even as a a, uh, a top blog in the industry, the struggle that still exists to get noticed? Yeah, I mean, I've seen it in so many different ways because, you know, I've seen it on um, Hype Machine, the process of trying to climb to the top of Hype Machine, got to go through some gatekeepers, it's a bit inefficient. Even if you get to the top, where is your fan page? Your fan page is Facebook or maybe SoundCloud now. So then you got to get people to come back to your Facebook so, um, and activate as a fan. So in, in, you know, in tech, we talk about conversion funnels. Um, you know, every time you've got to convert someone to the next step, you lose 80, 90% of those people. So when you have your song on a blog or on Hype Machine and you're then trying to get them back to Facebook, you could have the top song in the day, top song in the blog sphere for the day, but come out of it with a few hundred new Facebook fans. And then if you can only reach out to 1% of those Facebook fan, fans, that whole process didn't get you that far. It's, I mean, it does. You, know, you, you get known by people in the industry, you're breaking out in that way. It's the same thing with YouTube channels. I mean, we've been on, um, you know, they were talking about Suicide Sheep today. We've been on Suicide Sheep. I love that channel. It's awesome. Um, and our songs have gotten hundreds of thousands of plays. Um, but, you know, again, we're trying, we're communicating with our fans on Facebook. So, turning those fan, turning those plays into fans is tough and this is why breaking out in the music industry is very hard and you need someone like yourself really like helping you through that because you have to have all the different angles you have to have the great story the great branding a, 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 a strong release schedule you know you have to great do so music many different, come on great 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 well I'm I'm putting the great music as as a given, you have to have great. Yeah, music. but that's that's the first problem sometimes. How many? I think so many people do that. I get so many calls yeah. from DJs, producers every day. They say, "How can I get more Facebook fans so I can get paid more money for shows?" Because my friend over here, he's my peer, and now he's becoming my competitor because he's buying Facebook fans. What the fuck? I mean, what do I do? And I'm saying to myself, "Man, what happened to the days where artists had a voice? What happened to the days where it was about the music first? And it's so easy. Like even I, Connor, it's not just you. Even I yeah. will bring up those things sometimes first. But it, it all really starts with the great music. And I just say that because I know there's so many managers, artists, um, publicists, agents, people that watch this show. Forget that because even in our own daily conversation, we forget to put it first. But go on, yeah. sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, no. That's I mean that's the other half of the half of the problem because if you have, um, you know, if you have a machine where where breaking doesn't always happen organically, breaking 
um, comes out of all of these relationships, these relationships can be, um, you know, they can be leveraged for bad or good. Um, you take, you know, our most, our most republic, our most viral artist on Weibo this month. Who was it? You tell me. It was me. Zoo. It was Zoo. Really? Yeah. So, um, the 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 reason why I look at that and. Um, I, th I think that's a really powerful signal because um, when people are saving, the way that distribution on Weibo works is I save a song to my playlist, you're following me, you get it in your feed. If you like it, you'll save it to your playlist, your friends will get it on their feed. And so on and so on and so on. So if a song is really great and someone wants to save it to continue listening to it, that's the mechanism with which the music shared. And if it hits our charts, then it gets republished out through the rest of, you know, down through an even bigger network. Um, so the fact that the signal is saving equal sharing means that that music has to be really good. It can't happen for a reason because it's a, you know, a Ganyam style crazy video. Like those will get shared, but it's a different impulse for why you're saving the song. So that is actually the other side of what I'd really like to improve is um, you know, music going viral more efficiently because everything happens on one network. More music going viral more efficiently because it happens through a crowd upvoting music versus one or two gatekeepers. And music going more viral because it's a stronger signal because it happens through something like saving to actually listen to it. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's what we're working to to kind of democratize and make music distribution more efficient. Yeah, social endorsement is so key. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about the genre walls coming down. I think Lord has you know, done a great job of it. Collaborations like Skrillex and ASAP Rocky prove that anything is possible. Um, every day we continue to ask ourselves, what genre is this, you know, our new favorite artist? And I think mm -hmm. it's a really powerful thing. Likewise, in the industry, many of us are beginning to take on multiple roles. You are, um, as we've talked about already, a producer. You are, at the end of the day, a blogger. You are also a tech startup founder. Um, let's talk about the first two for a second. Are there any similarities between what it takes to be noticed as a recording artist to what it takes to be noticed as a blog. Because I've had a lot of people recently that are asking me not just about what it takes to be noticed as an artist, but what it takes to be noticed as a blog. I think a lot of people have interest in blogging. Um, but the, the truth is that the majority of the hundreds of publications that are posting mm. about you, which I am incredibly grateful for, don't get right. any hits. Um, right. But there's some that do. And, and Ear Milk has become one of those. And I'd like to know from you if there was a certain... Beyond, beyond just having a great voice or having a distinctive mm -hmm. brand, you know, is there something specific advice you would give to um, to those out there that are looking to start their business and get noticed? Yeah, so uh, with Ear Milk, uh, part of the reason why I didn't start Ear Milk, I joined Ear Milk, and um, you know, one of the reasons why I did that was because I used to be an event promoter and we were promoting EDM back in, like EDM kind of like how EDM is presented now back in 2006, like putting, um, putting um, you know, underground EDM artists in sort of balling venues. Um, and we had a blog and it was going very well and it was definitely one, it's stwoods.com um, and it's still going today. Um, and it was uh, yeah, a high traffic EDM blog but then Hype Machine decided not to put it up because Hype Machine um, doesn't put up event promoters music blogs. Uh, so eventually I ended up getting involved with Ear Milk and the reason why I got involved with them was because of how well they did the, um, the branding and they were some of the first people putting those evocative photos. They don't put up any photo of an artist they have this type of photo. It, it was like Majestic Casual before Majestic Casual was doing it. Different, different vibe, but, but, it was, uh, but they, the fact they, that it was branded, a vibe. It was a vibe. They branded the site. 
they went out further and um, and actually developed the blog out more, so it was more than just you know a feed of um, of images, and that that's just the key to everything. They uh, they branded it. They branded it. They had a vibe, and it's the same thing you see with Dancing Astronaut and the other big music blogs that are blowing up right now. Uh, you look at Dancing Astronaut. They've had great branding. Um, they they have a look and feel that's unmistakable. And that's the same thing with artists. You look at Zoo, he came out with this great story, great branding, that, that even though you didn't know his name, you knew the image, and consistent good content. And that's pretty key for any content sort of driven product. So great branding, great story, you know, Ear Milk has a great vibe to the, the content and great branding, and that's how you're going to develop a product. Sure. Um, let's take a question from our audience real quick. Chad, Down want, Chad Downs excuse me, wants to know, did working toward trending on Hype Machine pay off? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, of course. And uh, what we're trying to do is Im improve how you can break out as an artist and improve how music can get distributed. But um, trending on Hype Machine still paid off. I mean, a lot of our relationships are built out of that. Um, you know, remixes came. Uh, we've got some records that uh, have recent, recently been signed um, that came out of tracks going in the top five of Hype Machine. Um, yeah, it, it, it's great. You're, you're, you're big, but you're just not as big as you could be. Um, and and that's what we're going to do with Wavo. Cool, brother. I look forward to seeing it. Um, I know you're usually based out of Toronto, correct? Based out of Montreal. Oh, Montreal. I'm so sorry. Yeah. That's, that's like an we're absolute no um, But if you, if you have any interest, no, it was the East Coast. If you have any interest in coming down to New York, I'll be down here for the next few days and always love sitting down and strategizing with you because I do look forward to seeing Wavo um, continue to break down those walls and give the power to the people to decide what music that they like to hear. So thank you so much yeah, for joining 100%. us. And if you're a young artist, submit your music to Wavo. Get trending on our charts. Wavo.me. Wavo.me. You got it. Connor, thank you for joining us. Thanks a lot, Jake. Um, of course, a couple brief notes before we leave today. I would like to congratulate Jahan Youssef, Yasmin Youssef, and Christopher Trindle of Corella. Um, they're single, alive, we yesterday were granted with our platinum plaques for the single, and I'm very, very, very proud of them. Hopefully the first of many to come. And lastly, um, if you like the beanie I'm wearing, you can purchase it for $12.95 on thirdbrain.com. Only fucking with you. I will see you guys next week. Thank you so much.